We're live. Hey, welcome to another show in this exciting episode of We Will Be Talking About the Homebrew Exploit, uh, the Cove, Code Cov was supply chain hack, mm -hmm. FBI, the FBI doing free IT, WordPress says flock off, Coinbase goes mental, and of course, a uh, quick live demo of Kubes KL. My name's Steve Jaguer. And I'm Mike Foster. Welcome once again to... Yeah, code. code. Change the that's, intro. A, that's a tongue twister, huh? Code, code, code. code she code. sells seashells. The human torch was denied a bank loan. I didn't do my vocal exercises <laughs> before getting getting going on that one. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah, we got a packed show for you guys today. So thanks for joining. And uh, what are some of the shout outs before we get started? Anything on the docket that we need to talk about, Steve? KubeCon's coming up. KubeCon two weeks. Uh, well, Two weeks time, actually. I'm probably getting ahead of myself, like, but barely two weeks, right? It'll be a week Monday or Tuesday. It'll start. Whole bunch of weird day zero stuff going on. I saw in the Kubernetes. Do you want we maybe watch the Kubernetes office hours where they were? Was it that one where they're saying like, there are so many day zero events. It's kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like it's like you there's there's something for everyone but in a way if you're really into the scene there's too many things it's like a too big it's like going to a restaurant and the menu is like ridiculous and you're like i don't know what to choose now make it easy for me i don't know i found it i found it overwhelming actually yeah people stop hacking things stop breaking things stuff yeah it's there's too many it's, too it's, much going on it, there's too much going on what other weekly call outs do we have to say well the usual um uh, twitch and youtube do your thing. You, you got yeah, yeah. that. So, you know, weekly we're live on Twitch. Uh, we're looking to stream live on YouTube next week. So if you're tuning in later, you know, come back next week at a slightly different time. So we're going to be doing an hour earlier next week because we have a special guest. But again, like and follow on Twitch. Subscribe on YouTube. Give us the thumbs up. Let us know that you appreciate us. Throw some comments in there. Tell us what we missed. Any cool articles that you want us to discuss. Appreciate your feedback. I Yeah. Do we say who the guest is? I think so. All right, let's stitch her up. So Liz Rice is going to be with us next week, uh, probably doing the stupidest thing ever because we're actually being inconsistent about our broadcast time in the week where we're going to have somebody special on the show, but we have to move it around for a variety of reasons. But it's going to be cool because Liz has got a new gig at Isovalent and she's an authority on all things KubeCon. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we're excited to see and get her feedback. And then hopefully if we ask really nicely, we'll learn a little bit more about the EBPF and psyllium infused world of her her new uh, her new world isovalent. So she's going to talk about that as well. So that's very exciting. First time we've had a guest. Super excited. Yeah. Hopefully we get more guests on. We are. Yeah. I'm just really excited for it. So yeah. Tune in at a 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. GMT time technically, yeah. and then 8 a.m. East uh, Pacific. So look forward to seeing you there. Should very we get exciting. into the first topic? Yeah, let's do it. Let's bring the screen up. And you added this one. Let's show both of these. Let's let's do that. This is the one you first added. How you found this? Yeah, home anyway. exploit, uh, remote code execution. Did, did by the way, Steve, did you take a look at this one? I I gave it a quick wait. Well, I did. Well, here's the TLDR. Mm -hmm. Merging a malicious pull request to go. Yeah, but I did go on. You tell okay. me though. Yeah, it was possible to merge a malicious pull request by confusing the library that is used in the automated pull request review script developed by the project. So there's a review script when you're doing a PR to tell you what's going on. And you can confuse that script to allow you to submit a malicious PR. Uh, so something, there's some sort of bug in the original automated uh, check, right? So part of the mm. supply chain, you had some sort of uh, automated check and there was some sort of code and you could sneak one past the goalie, so to speak. So yeah, they go through, they talk about the initial investigation, the investigation of the CI script, exactly what they were looking for in the uh, in the GitHub action. So it's pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting article. Don't know if you have any thoughts on that, as, Steve. It counts, it counts as supply chain still, doesn't it? Because it's, <laughs> yeah. everything yeah, counts it as to be a common chain. theme. 
Um, Brew did, uh, Brew also released their own security incident disclosure on their blog, which is linked to by this very sexy looking blog article, which has way more information on it. And we will have we have we sorted. This is a good point. All the links that we talk about, we have a location for those yet. Yeah, they're in the Excel sheet. So on Twitch, you should be able to see a little Excel link. Uh, I need to update them for the last two weeks, but the links are normally in there. And uh, I'll update them after this stream if you're looking to check out more of the, the stuff right. that we talk about. So, okay, very cool. Yeah, this is this, this is cool. I like uh, there's a lot here though. Like you can see, right? We're not going to unpack this all for you now. You're going to have to put some effort in and go read it if you want to learn more about it, right? We'd be do a whole show on this. It's also really interesting to see how people look for vulnerabilities too, right? So they understand maybe the process that's taking place for the check and they can go in and some of these CI scripts are, you know, they're open, they're available on GitHub. You can go and see these in the repos. And so they can go and check and look through and say, oh, there's a little bit of gap in this code here. It's only checking for X and not Y. So, you know, it the the article itself really walks through how they found it and how they patched it, right? It's It's cool. It is good. It is good. Um, cool. All right. So we bash on to the next sort of breachy thing. Oh, very punny. I see what you uh, did there. Yeah. Uh, we have next is the Code Cove uh, bash uploader security breach. So Code Cove, if you know, well, if you know Code Cove, cool. If you don't, you don't. Um, but Code Cove had a component which is a bash uploader that integrates into a variety of different CI areas, and in within the script for its uploader which looks dangerous. Like if you look at the, the actual script, the uploader itself, it's this, it's a monster script. You can actually, if you click on there, I think it might actually the go bash there. uploader link. You can, let, let me just take a risk here and see if it'll actually, so that, that will be the script and I'm off camera. I'm going to, See if I can, but it is monstrous, right? To see what's in here. So this you were talking about people who look for vulnerabilities, right? Somebody obviously looked at that script, and it's not, it doesn't take a, a bash expert. It is an awesome bash script, though. If you like, like if you're a bash geek, mm -hmm. of which I am, you go through and you see like some of the code in there. It's cool. They obviously worked a long time on it. But if you have any of this in here, this is the indicator. Uh, which I should highlight on the screen, actually, so you can see that even better. Boom. Here. Yeah, at that command, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, they're redacted, so they added a third-party server So it's server sending the data out to here. So it's doing a thing. It's going and getting your shit. Oop. <laughs> and it's sending it to their remote location. So whatever it is you're uploading is also going somewhere else. That's a fair way of saying it, right? So if you've got mm -hmm. stuff with credentials in it, or you've just got any sensitive data or anything like that happens as part of your CI, because in CI, you feel like you're safe. Uh, it went to some magic donate uh, do destination uh, all in one line. Uh, but what's amazing is that somebody somehow became part of the code cov world and was able to add that line. And there's nothing here that says how that happened. Hmm. It's very cool. Inside job. Inside job. Yeah, well, somehow, right? Uh, inside job, nation state. I mean, it's there's been, over the past year, there's been a few interesting CI-based um, manipulations, breaches, whatever you want to call them. There's that one that was mining um cryptocurrencies using circle ci or something and it recent like that was was before the show started mm -hmm. otherwise we would have covered that but yeah it's interesting that's that's the keys to the kingdom if you can get uh ci as a service and then you can somehow manipulate that to your own ooh, you know malicious gain then very dangerous so they fixed sure. the script it's easy you just upgrade because the, the script itself is part of a uh but you go get it there it is CodeCoveIO slash bash. Uh, but they do talk about self-hosted and on-premise versions of CodeCove that it's obviously unlikely you're impacted because if you're on-prem, you're probably air-gapped anyway, which is why you use that. So it's probably not stealing your data, but the point is upgrade. Uh, and it's very simple. Go get the new one. Just really fascinating. I, uh, this is one of those one to watch is that we would do if, we, if there's anything further that says how it actually happened, then 
we will we will we will check that out. I have a follow up. We'll do a follow up, kind of like this follow up that we have next. <laughs> Never escapes the news for longer than a day. Never escapes the news. No, solar winds attack. Uh, U.S. formerly President Biden and the Biden administration officially. I think we knew this, right? We kind of knew. Yeah, it just wasn't official. <laughs> now it's official, so we have to talk now about it's, it again. It's definitely, it's definitely Russia. Uh, and I thought what was fun, this is really small. I like dark reading, but man, they look like they're from 1995 <laughs> when you look at their, their thing. This is the vendors put on the U.S. Treasury Department sanctions list were, and this is my favorite, positive technologies. That's it. <laughs> What, what what could go what why wouldn't you trust them michael they're positive technologies they're not called spy technologies they're not called nation state technologies advanced system technology it's positive so super positive that's great there's nothing to worry about whoever named this company is going to come out and name the next company negative technology and then just combine it, them it will, or maybe neutral will, technology that way they float under the radar <laughs> I would like to see. So you see the advanced system technology and positive. If they called it advanced positive technologies, so it was APT. I've <laughs> persistent like it, it. It did a a pastiche on the acronym that actually says directly we are a threat. That would be very funny. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So that's that's that one. Uh, we're going to keep watching that. Uh, I think we said that SolarWinds was in our very first show and will continue to be in every show for the rest of time. Seems like it. Cool. All right. Something that isn't SolarWinds. Uh, thought this was pretty uh, interesting. FBI removed hacker backdoors from vulnerable Microsoft Exchange servers. Uh, so uh, in case everybody is aware of the big Exchange server hack, uh, I think something like 90% had been fixed with the updated patch, but there were a bunch that hadn't. And so the FBI got a court order to basically enter businesses' private networks and fix the bug to re remove the malicious code uh, themselves because it was an ongoing nation security threat, I guess, was probably the argument to the courts. So the FBI was able to gain access to the private networks in order to go and patch the exchange servers that hadn't been updated. So, uh, Steve, you made the comment that, oh, it's great. We get to outsource our, <laughs> was it our SRE capabilities why to patch? the FBI now? Yeah, why patch? Why patch? <laughs> why patch? Um, just, to wait. just let it happen and wait for the men in blue to bust your door open and, and start, mm -hmm. you know, start patching yeah. your, your exchange servers. Earlier this year, four zero day vulnerabilities for the Microsoft Exchange server. So, if you want to look at, uh, check out more. Uh, definitely take a look at that article. It was a, a massive hack. And uh, yeah, so apparently, I guess, all the exchange servers are quote unquote safe now. I think it's negative reinforcement. It's just, yeah. yeah. Negative technologies was uh, responsible for that one. Negative technologies, probably. Yeah, it should have known better. Yeah, there it is, four zero days. Yeah, so that's, I think that's kind of like, that's almost, we didn't have that in the WTF section. It kind of probably should have been because that's, that's weird. That's weird. That <laughs> the who's who whose job? This is funny. Go. Cool. So whose job is it at the FBI where they're like, uh, so um, Eugene, what are you good at? Well, I, I'm pretty good at uh, upgrading Exchange servers. Finally, we have a job for you. <laughs> Get out from behind that desk, Eugene. You're you're going on the road. Oh man. <laughs> It anyway, is it is right. a pretty impressive feat, though, <laughs> that the FBI was able to to do that fairly fairly quickly, honestly. Yes, it is. Well, is it done? It must. I guess it's done, right? I'm assuming so, that's why this article is out now. Hmm. Let's assume it's done and everybody's safe. Yeah, hundreds of unmitigated web shell web shells have been identified and removed from hundreds of systems. Okay, it removed awesome. one hacking group's remaining web shells entirely. There you go. Awesome. Job done. Righty. Impressive. God, nice work, FBI. All right. Uh, the So this is kind of an ongoing one. The next one, I'm going to do the WordPress says, flock off. 
So this is, and actually this is kind of one of your babies, Mike. It's, you've talked about the federated learning of cohorts. Oh, there it is right there. Darn, I thought I was actually rem just remembering it. I was impressing myself, but there it is written right in front of me. Uh, yeah, the new Chrome browser deal. We talked about last week, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. And then this week, WordPress, who, well, claims to be, I don't know if it says here, 41% of the internet, some ridiculous number of sites are powered by WordPress. Wow. And they've said, is it here? No, I must have read it somewhere. Either that I'm just making up a stat. It sounds really cool. <laughs> uh, there it is. There, WordPress powers 41%. It's a little small there of the web, which seems crazy. But they don't, some people don't like for obvious reasons that this this version of being watched. And there, here's the code. Um, you can just grab that, I think, probably and shove it into your functions PHP now or wait till July when a version comes out and they're backporting it. So they disable it in your browser, which is interesting. Do mm -hmm. is that what do you think? We were talking about this beforehand. Like, is yeah, I also, I also posted a link in the chat if anybody's watching and they want to see if they're flocked. So, my general understanding from following it is none of the Chrome browsers in the EU have been upgraded with the flock capability. It's mostly in the US and it's a very small percentage. You can opt out of being flocked, so to speak, by disabling third party cookies altogether. But really, the whole point, in case people missed it, is Flock is this sort of uh, Google doesn't need third party cookies because everybody's going to Google anyways. So they're looking at when you hit Google and you go into a website and you come back, what the timing is, um, what you're looking at specifically, how long you're staying on websites. They're not actually tracking what website you go to or what you click through anymore. So part of this initiative is they're implementing Flock, but they're also still implementing third party cookies at the same time on select browsers. So you can check that out if you're interested in learning more of this, amiflocked.org. Let's do this, hold on. Um, yeah, go ahead, press it, check for flock ID. I'm safe. Yeah, yes, that's, go that's ahead. Yeah, there you go. What is flock? Yeah, it says I'm not, but I think that's because I'm in the EU. It was very convenient that Nobody who is who would by default fall under GDPR seem to have flock applied to them, which because they're probably like, I don't know, are we allowed? Let's just not do that. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's all these all these poor people. So you're Canada. Are you have you tried it? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not flocked right now. Oh, all right. Well, that was <laughs> currently unflocked. There you go. Live demo of of the flock test. That was cool. It's kind of fun to say. Right. I yeah, yeah, you were mentioning you brought up we had a conversation about this and I I'm a little mixed. I need to see what the advantages of Flock are. I have to actually really deep dive into the GitHub repo and understand a little bit more. But you know, third party cookies, if Google has the ability, and I mean Google's to a certain extent a free service, right? I mean, you have Gmail, you have Google, like all for free. Obviously, they need to make money some way, so they make it on advertising and recommendations, right? If they're doing that without a help from third-party websites and third-party cookies, all the power to them. I don't know. It's it, it's it's kind of just like we're trading one method of surveillance for another method of surveillance. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it seemed it seemed less intrusive to me, but I don't really, I don't know. Yeah, it seemed like a better version. I always find it odd when, like along the lines of what you're saying, when you go to sites or they always make you opt in to ads and they say, do you want context sensitive ads? And your instinct as a rebel is to say, no. Mm -hmm. you, that doesn't mean you don't get ads. That just means you get ones that suck. Yep. As opposed to you know those boots I was looking for. So I, I'm mixed. Like one, one, it feels like, they're, I know they're going to use it to characterize and somehow create a duplicate of me that will take over me, my existence in the future. But for now, I, I kind of want those context sensitive ads. I don't know, maybe, I, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think about when you opt into a lot of those. It, so I don't know if, uh, what's, what's the extension that I have? I have uh, like Privacy Badger, for example. And so you can tell mm -hmm. when you get to certain websites, they're like, is it accessing your Facebook data? Like a lot of websites go and pull, you know, username, 
not not name they'll pull like your age and location for example right and they can kind mm -hmm. of say okay well you know you're um, a guy and you're in T toronto or you're in california or something like that and they can recommend based on that what flock does is it's just it looks at your search results and what you're doing and what websites you go to to make an inference on what type of person you are to sell that data right mm. so instead of directly going and pulling that data from a website in which you've put the information in right right uh you know they're making inferences using basically like a sort of they're, they're group people together based off their searches and they say okay well if you're in this group it's highly likely that you are like you know uh, a woman in your 20s based off what you're searching for right right and at the <laughs> to me at the end of the day it's like if you're putting your public information online in any capacity on a website you know you should be protecting that stuff first i would i would worry less about flock and i would worry more about how much you're putting up there if you if you care about those things yeah right yeah yeah i i mean there are there, there's obviously some nuance to this that we might be missing so if, if oh, we sure. are and you're watching this anywhere where you can comment on the show please inform our moronic minds how we're missing this mm -hmm. cool shall we move yeah i'm off locked out all right all right um then the next thing which i've conveniently not got his email up so this is the this is the what do i call it retraction or uh, moment of, of idiocy so we i we did was it me or was it you i think we did this jet stack uh demo uh, i was a service just like SaaS thing where we, we went and played with it live mm -hmm. and i didn't get anything like it was like well it, it felt like it was supposed to run some kind of a security check on a cluster and didn't really do much right we were like this is strange you probably very smartly said well, I don't have cert manager running. Maybe I, maybe I needed that running, right? Because that's Jetstack. It made sense. And I think essentially that was the case because we had Richard Collins from Jetstack who watched the show. Thanks, Richard. And write to me and correct me and said, look, uh, but he did, he did actually find it interesting because he talked about like the starting point that we used was an old pre-flight repo that they didn't realize was incorrect. And it was, hmm. that's what took us and I got that old repo out of a newsletter. So someone else in a newsletter picked it up on their radar somehow. It ended up in one of my newsletters. I clicked through, I went through and went, this looks cool, and just followed the directions. You remember we found the directions really conflicting and confusing. And that's Back because- Back and forth, yeah. We were on the wrong, it didn't make, the older repo. We were on an old repo, which was still up. And so that was actually, in a good way, they fixed all that. So if we went and did it again, it would be better. So maybe we'll do that at some point in the, in yeah. the future show. But what was cool is thanks, Jetstack, for correcting us. Uh, and hey, I guess well done us for finding a flaw in usability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we used our uh, incredibly low mind power to yeah. not diagnose an issue. And then anyways, yeah. And, yeah. It was... So if, if, we, if we got confused, other people were getting confused. And it sounds like they fixed it. So we'll have to revisit sometime in the future. So not too bad. Yeah, and it's it, interesting to see the, so somebody else wrote about it, then you picked it up and then we started talking about it. And it's it's the the power of the internet. Make sure things are clean, document things cleanly because you never know how it's gonna propagate, right? Right, then two idiots on Twitch are getting confused by it and uh, you get some minor, minor yeah. brand damage. Yeah, then because Richard imagine... Collins has to write this, this long email, unfortunately. <laughs> so sorry, sorry for that, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should you. apologize to him. Really, yeah, <laughs> not the other way around. Sorry, it's the Canadian. so that's yeah. Sorry, it was uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, cool. All right. So the I think the this is oh we can, we're moving to the WTF section now. So I'm gonna let me. Uh, oh, oh. got trigger happy there. Yeah, we're here. The <laughs> first one. Hold on, before you start, Steve, we did forget something else. The thoughts expressed on the show belong to the presenters only and not any employer or sponsor. And it was up to me to join that to our starting, so I still have uh, some actions <laughs> on that. Uh, so this first one in the WTF section is one that happened to me, so it's not even a news article. It is an actual real-life experience. Uh, but something that was in the news 
I'd go with two months ago maybe, was apps on your phone, specifically iOS apps, iPhone apps, that continually were scraping your clipboard. The clipboard on the, on the iPhone's weird in that it kind of only ever has one thing on it. It's whatever the last thing you copied was. And then it's whatever the next thing. It doesn't retain a history. There's not like, it's just a scratch pad. But apps were starting up and we're just data mining and just grabbing whatever's on it. TikTok, oh, there's a big list. And a lot of them were like, I don't know what any of these things were. A lot of them were games, right? But TikTok was one that was just grabbing your clip. Can you imagine? Like, if you imagine on a phone, particularly if you're accessing LastPass or 1Password, you're grabbing passwords and you're using them to paste because it's not that clean of an interface sometimes and you have to do that. What if that's the last thing you did? And then, or just anything private. TikTok was just grabbing whatever was there to see if they could sell you ads or use it or whatever, right? And that freaks people out. So the other day I was... Uh, so the new a change to um, iOS 14 dot something, I want to say five or something, but let's just assume iOS something, was that they started a little pop-up that says when someone, like if you just paste in iOS in 14 now, it actually pops up and says, you just pasted from, and I thought that was really handy because it was cool to see you pasted from notes or you pasted from, you get a little bit of a confirmation that you just pasted from something. Mm -hmm. But from a security aspect, it rocked because when I opened up eToro, which I occasionally use for fiddling with the uh, stock market in my pathetic way, uh, this came up as eToro started. And you, it's probably really hard to see on the screen, but there is an eToro logo right there in the middle in, in a super faint font there. And I was like, what the hell? Because I didn't do that paste. That and I, I flipped the context away and went back to eToro and it did it again. So eToro, like TikTok, is grabbing your clipboard. And I was like, you bastards. <laughs> uh, I know. So now, now my preventative measure, um, I gave them like a one-star review because I, you know, I'm like a not in my backyard kind of guy. <laughs> and um, And now before I go in, I go to my notepad and I... I copy that, and then I go back to eToro. And so I just hope someday, somewhere, some data miner is reading me repeatedly pasting that into eToro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really sticking it to them, Steve. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It makes me feel good every time now, instead of uh, knowing there's nothing else I can do about it. So I thought, oh, well. All right. The... Next one is yours. So let me bring it up. You can tell me all about it. Uh, sure. Yeah. So Linux bans University of Minnesota for sending buggy patches in the name of research. And so, yeah, so really interesting. I think so. My guess here, and I'm assuming because it's a couple people going for their doctorates that they were trying to check and test supply chain hacks and come up with some sort of study about what you know, things should and shouldn't happen in terms of, you know, when codes checked in, but so they set some sort of study and they've been continuously pushing basically buggy patches through PR requests into the Linux kernel. And finally, uh, Greg uh, Crow Hartman, well, I assume is basically one of the main maintainers. I really don't know that much about Greg, but there's uh, Greg on Twitter posted it as well. So I can copy and paste that into the chat if you guys are interested. Uh, wrote a very fierce feedback, basically saying, <laughs> we are not your testing ground for buggy code. This And it really is insane when you think about it. I mean, how many people use Linux and you really want to test and try to push something through? Like what was what was the end game here, right? And let's say you, yeah, okay, you're running a test, but what if it worked? What if something happened? Um, anyway, so I think, and rightfully so, they banned the Minnesota department because it was somewhat of a sanctioned test or some sort of experiment that they were performing. And I assume that since the department head wrote back that there will be some sort of corrective action in Minnesota, uh, they won't be doing this in the future, the University <laughs> of Minnesota. So what is this? What's the yeah. plonk? 
Is that a dropping the mic or something? Or what is that? I think that so. <laughs> Plonk. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but it is stupid. Whose idea? Who thought that would be okay? It, it, yeah, the other thing too is it's also different when you're doing an experiment on other people without their consent to a certain extent, right? Because you're pushing code that somebody has to check on slash you know get rid of in a branch for what just so that you can say that you're doing something there should be you know some sort of sanction you can't just like randomly do tests on people it's not really ethical um it's a weird it's a it's weird bonkers. way of going about stuff yeah it's really weird yes yes i mean when i do we used to do an example like the coop hunter coop hunter when i was at aqua we used to do coop hunter and the first thing we used to say is don't just point coop hunter at someone else's cluster to see if it works because you don't have a cluster ready like that's like come that's the same kind of stupid move you do like oh let's just check the supply chain by putting buggy like it's moronic it's it's crazy and i think that was a fair reaction mm -hmm. so big wtf there and uh plunk i don't, I don't know that's our it's gonna be a catch tag now catchphrase yeah <laughs> i like it all righty. Uh, we're on a new section. I think that's the last of the WTFs. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. It is. It is. Then we are here. I could just listen to that again. Yeah, I love that intro. Well, we talked about solar wind, so we have to talk about some sort of <laughs> cryptocurrency now, right? Mm. Yeah, that's totally it. Coinbase. Coinbase went public. What, why, blah, blah, blah is Coinbase. We don't have to get into this, but I, mean, I use Coinbase. I, I got some crypto. I've got a variety of weird cryptos and some of the more common ones like Ethereum and Litecoin. And Coinbase is what I use because way back, I think Coinbase even described itself as like, the gateway to crypto because it's just super easy to use. Any idiot could sign up. It's pretty safe. If you look at the security team that actually run the security at Coinbase, they're like nuclear level uranium uh, security people. So it's all good, but they went public and now they're worth 85.8 billion. Well, they're valuated at that. Well, it's it's a stock value, right? So yeah, yeah. they where where was it? Here it is. There. So they expected it to be two hundred fifty dollars uh, stock value, mm -hmm. and then it did the usual flippy floppy and went up to three eighty one, three eighty one. Then it went to four twenty nine, and a bunch of people went, "I'm out of here," and it went back down to three twenty eight, uh, where it kind of sat for a bit. But that's still way higher than two fifty, and it was bonkers. It was. That's that's cuckoo. So that's one of the, and then immediately afterwards, all crypto went ah, like as crypto does. Yeah, I I do think what's interesting here because we talk about valuation specifically about some of these big spenders that go public, which um like I, like Snowflake, which had what it had like a five hundred billion evaluation, even though its revenue is only like thirty million. Mm. Coinbase actually makes money. Yeah, <laughs> they actually have revenue. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's you know, let's do that. One point two eight billion in profit or in in total income and three hundred and twenty million in profit. So, it yeah. I I don't know how stock markets working nowadays. It seems insane to me. Some of the valuations that are thrown out there, but um, yeah, they actually make money. Pretty cool. Yeah, Co companies that go public without a underline. Clear path to prob probability. Like Uber, Lyft, and Snap. <laughs> wow, it's <laughs> and Twitter. Twitter just, she's taking shots. It's at just that company. Pop, pop, pop. Yeah, I like this. This is why this is on here because you're like, why are you guys talking about this? This isn't a tech company. No, but it's taking pot shots at the companies that we talk about. Like the reason this is called Big Spender and why we created it is because over the past four months we were like, we've been going what to the valuations that have been assigned to companies that have no profit essentially mm -hmm. the world we live in not this world <laughs> yeah so that's 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 kind of cool uh 
And I don't know, if you like crypto, it gives some uh, sort of credence to the crypto world, even though it is just, yes, crypto, this line down here, crypto still feels sketchy to me. Uh, that's because it is. Yeah. And is this stock sketchy? Probably not, because they make money off of quantity of trade, right? And so they're always going to keep making money, even doesn't matter what Bitcoin's worth. If people keep trading it, they keep making money. Mm -hmm. So probably a pretty good stock. Yeah, it shot up and then shot back down. I think the the day it opened, I remember looking yeah. at it uh, and it was just. A yeah, um, that was gonna. Yeah, a lot of hype. Good at it. A lot of hype. It's Retail trading, long. crazy. Uh, all right, into all right. the more informative section, slash, you know, a couple. Things for education, little tool time. Yeah, we had a, an article for better Git practices. Level up your Git game. Yeah, my Git mm -hmm. game's pretty bog standard. Uh, yours is, I'm sure, better than mine. But this this gets into the basics, like that I do, and then then it just started getting get what change. What did you read it? Did you uh, learn yeah, anything? Did a quick skim. Uh, yeah, I think. So there's, I, I, I kind of cheat on a lot of stuff because some, I, I don't really do a lot on the command line anymore. I use a lot of the VS code right. extensions, right? So mm -hmm. I've been doing these practices, but just in VS code. So I've never really had to, <laughs> had to use some of these commands, right? Fair. But yeah, the, the was, link copy with a Git work tree was an interesting one too. It, like. I, I, it's, it's not a big article, but it, it was just, it was very cool that I, there's always like, something to get right. Get tray pick, get work tree, get what changed. Like these are just commands. I'm like, Oh, okay. This combines a bunch of command. I would use three things where this is one. And I'm like, all right, I'm saving, I'm saving time. And it takes me no time to learn it. So I learned some things by reading this. And I also learned that there are some get uh, VS code extensions. I'm clearly not using. I need to get from you. So that would be good. Maybe you should do a live VS Code Git uh, masterclass for us. Uh, one of these shows. Yeah, the extensions that I like and everything I like to do. Sure, that, that actually would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Done. You're on the hook. You agreed. I, well, I was going to say that uh, one of the reasons why these articles are so interesting because when you look at GitOps, especially all the tools that are using GitOps now, it's all underlying Git. Like when you're talking about Tecton, right? When you're talking about uh, like you know, Terra scan or things like that, that are taking, you know, and, and making changes to your repos and doing things at the end of the day, that's the core technology. So really worthwhile to understand as much as you can about Git. And I find it's, you have people who have been in the industry and all it takes is you for just not to use Git day to day for like a year, six months. And then you come back and you're like, wait, how does Git work again? And I'm sitting there like, Oh yeah, that's right. It, then it all comes back. So it's a perishable skill. Yep. Well said. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's do the next one. Uh, this one, we get rid of the cookie consent nonsense before I share my screen. And... OPA masterclass. Yeah. That, that man says uh, an, o an OPA masterclass. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. That's actually, yeah. Okay. So we have, we have a get, get walkthrough OPA masterclass. Uh, I know I wanted to do a sort of Prometheus Grafana walkthrough as well. We can do that. We can get a guest to do the OPA masterclass because we can get Anders from um, Styra would come on. He'd come on yeah. like that and he can do a, a bit of OPA for us. So, but masterclass and the amount of time we have, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We'll do our best. That's good no. though. Let's reach out and get him on the show. Yeah, there you go. Batman. All right, sweet. That'd be All awesome. Right. It's coming. Oh, cool. It's coming. I we have promised to bring him on. All right, this is hilarious. So Cockroach Labs, we actually mentioned Cockroach Labs because they were one of our big spenders recently. They got a big whacking stupid amount of money, and we talked about how they do a distributed database within Kubernetes. And then they did this article, and the reason I wanted to bring it up, well, a because. It's Titanic, and and just if you go through and they got they have all these gifts with from the movie Titanic, 
comparing the Titanic to a monolith database and the ramifications of trying to do of recovery within a monolith database. And then if you have a distributed database, what happens? Redistribute imagine the Titanic with Kubernetes as a distributed database, Helm charts. It goes over the top with nautical themes uh, with references to Kate and Jack. And it's just, it is, it's like a masterclass in blog writing. It's hilarious, creative. There's memes. It's got an analogy that allows me to relate. And it's kind of correct. So I th and it's in the, the chat now. So check it out. Give it a read. I think some of us were already kind of on board with the distributed database versus the monolith, but it was just great if you're in the if you're in the the throes of justifying this in your organization. Great place to go check it out, and it's fun to read as well. So that's why I had to throw that in there because it was fun. Could add a, a breakdown of database options as well. To our, that's the one thing we haven't really discussed that much. Right, true. Oh God, so many options. We're, great, Thanks, we're creating Pat, a man. backlog. What was the homebrew exploit? Homebrew exploit. Uh, there was a um, CI pipeline check on PR commits. And the check in the CI pipeline was able to be circumvented. Batman, check it just, out. yeah, check it out. And yeah, if you miss anything and you want more in depth, check it out on YouTube after. It will be there. I'm sure it's in the comments, but it's there again. Cool. All right, let's do that. Come on back. We're almost done. And what's is it the, what's next? Oh, my Trello just logged out. What's next? Cube SQL. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is weird. I I think this is pretty obscure. This dude, whoever Dentrax is, did this thing called Cube SQL. I'm in dark mode. That's neat. Oh, it's even telling me I have dark mode. So <laughs> it's experimental tool for querying your Kubernetes API using SQL. It's very new. Like ridiculously new. It's hard to see. Uh, let me see if I've got it over here. So. I I popped up two kind clusters. This is really easy to, to if I, if, there. I created kind Steve and kind Michael. You can see the I don't have anything in it, so I just compared Kube system as a namespace. You can see select Kube system from mm -hmm. kind Steve and kind Michael, where the pod status phase equals running, and this is just take a look. It's the, just this just just the API. If you look at the JSON for anything that's running, and you see for a pod. Uh, you see the you see status, and then you see phase, and you see phase equals running. You can use your knowledge of JSON to filter anything within the namespace. So if there were deployments or any object, you can see how this is a pod, right? But if there's anything there, anything in that namespace that matches this, the where, then it'll pop up as a result. And what I liked is that it allowed me to compare two different contexts and therefore two different clusters. Mm -hmm. So if I was, I, I, I haven't played too much with it, but it made me feel like, what if I wanted to see that they were the same? Or what if I wanted to check all pods in a namespace on two clusters where the security context was empty or something like, you know what I mean? I think there is, this might be useful, maybe, but I think you could probably do a lot of it with JSON path. But I mean, it was the way you could check two contexts simultaneously. I thought, is it useful? What do you think? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it, right? I don't know. Is it? Written in Java equals boo. <laughs> Batman. Um, Who said written in Java? It's not written in Java. It's written in Rust. There you go. Oh, if he if he's talking about this, it's also if you're into Rust, it's a good Rust starter. So if you want to go help, it's actually like I because I was looking at Parser because I've something you're not seeing is that I managed to really break it um, trying to use wildcards before we started this, and I had to get into the Parser here to see why did it break. It was like. And I got way, I got into the weeds. Anyway, nevertheless, we don't need to do that again. But it is written in Rust, which is cool. So, and it's so small. If you just want to play with Rust, it's a great thing that maybe you can dive in and help this guy and contribute, right? Because I think he's the only one working on it at the moment. But it's, 
It's weird. It's I like it, but I'm not sure why. That's kind of where I stand on it. There's a few examples here that I did, like multiple names. It's it's a if you have the same namespace in two contexts. Otherwise, though, it's not really like SQL, right? You can't do select pod from here. The select is always a namespace, and the from is always a context, and then the where is really how you pick through the API. And two contexts only seems to make sense if you have the same namespace name in both. So it does seem like kind of designed for comparison. Yeah, I, I think it kind of makes sense. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about this now too. If like, let's say you're an admin, right? And you had a test cluster and a development cluster or something like that. And you wanted to check on your development teams and what they're doing and see the test cluster you basically could set just two different contexts, switch back and forth on your on your local system, and then just evaluate to be like, you know, what changes are they making right now? Um, it gives you a good visual. There are a ton of other ways to do the same thing, right? But really, yeah. you're going to be comparing changes to see uh, like what's changed in the in the Kubernetes objects, right? And honestly, yeah. you can probably even write something on top of this to say if there are changes that can be evaluated because you have some output, evaluate the output when there are changes, inform me or highlight them or do something. You can have some sort of cron job running in the background. Huh. Yeah. You wouldn't want to do this in production, obviously, but if you wanted to run it on the dev cluster, you could do something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I just think it was one of these tools that it's interesting, you know, when someone does like a weird mashup hybrid of technologies like this, and they've obviously yeah. put a bunch of effort in. Yeah, here you're sick uh, of YAML. Here, yeah, <laughs> here, just, let's do this now. And they make a little logo. How long do people spend on logos? I don't know, but for it's something logo. so new, it is cool. I like it. Yeah. So there we go. That's not meant to be. Oh, we have some suggestion cloud queries. Yeah, cloud query as well. Yeah. Check that there we out. go. It's something else for a future episode, though. Now we have to get their backlog is growing. I think that's the end. That's Makes that's it. it. Uh, are we done the show? Is that it? Was there anything else, Mr. Foster? That is it. Just a shout out that you know we have our special guest Liz Rice is going to be on next week at a 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. GMT time. An hour, yeah, an hour earlier next week. Yeah, an hour earlier. So. And again, always, if you miss it, go on YouTube, uh, like on Twitch, subscribe on YouTube. We will be live on YouTube and Twitch next week. So just a heads up, if you're at work and you don't have access to Twitch, you can catch us there. And then, of course, sign up for KubeCon, because that's what we're going to be talking about, that and ISOVAL and Cilium. So check out KubeCon, Cloud Native Security Day has actually a really good, really, really, really nice lineup. That's so one. that's one of the day zero. Is that That's a day zero, right? Along with the 10,000 of the day zeros, that's one of them. What? Cloud Native Security Day? Is, is, it a, is that a day zero event for KubeCon? Yeah, something like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Sign up for that. If you're yeah. watching this, sign up for that. That's we'll see the that. kind of thing we watch. All right, <laughs> yeah. sweet. Shall we sign off? Let's do it. All right, my name is Steve Jaguar. And I'm Mike Foster. Thanks for watching. Thanks.